Good morning. <laughs> Happy Black History Month, everyone. So glad that you are here. Thank you for joining us today um, at the HHS Black Health Forum, Improving Health Equity, part of the Department of Health and Human Services ongoing celebration of Black History Month. My name is Miranda Lynch Smith, and I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Human Services Policy. I wear a dual hat. Um, I also perform the duties of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation. I'm excited to moderate this conversation today. Um, it comes on the heels of the release of HHS's Equity Action Plan, where we continue to double down on ensuring that we are intentionally including and tracking our success towards optimal health and well being for all people. This morning, we are so looking forward to engaging with you for a time of reflection, celebration, and hope. You'll hear from leaders across the Department of Health and Human Services and the Biden-Harris administration, including our Secretary Becetta, Mayor Stephen Benjamin from the White House Office of Public Engagement, CMS Administrator Shakita brooks Lashore, and you'll also hear from leaders from the black health community leaders of civil rights organizations and medical societies. You, you'll also hear from people working on the front lines to improve the health of the black community, as well as the next generation of black healthcare leaders. So I won't spend too much time um, additionally welcoming you here today. I would like to really turn it over to the, uh, the Intergovernmental and External Affairs Acting Director, Jessica Smith, Come on up and welcome the crowd. Thank you, Miranda. Uh, that's Miranda Lynch Smith. I'm Jessica Smith, uh, all part of the, big, the same big HHS family. Um, thank you all for joining us today for our second annual um, Black Health Forum. Uh, I know a number of you were here with us last year. And in fact, I've enjoyed catching up with some of you that were here with us last year. And we also have some new faces in the room, so um, thank you for joining us originally or uh, welcome for the first time. Um, I just want to offer a, a few thank yous uh, to the folks involved in putting this forum together. Um, first, the Reverend Dr. Q English, uh, who runs our Faith-Based Partnership Center. Clearly has some fans here in the room. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, so Q will be moderating a panel with us later today. I also want to thank our Office of Public Affairs, uh, who's always instrumental in putting together our beautiful graphics. And by the way, if you see them over there, there's a wall you can take pictures and please post to social media. Uh, we would appreciate that. And lastly, I also want to thank my team, uh, Sainab Jama, who is standing right here, I was really instrumental as well as uh, Tanya Calais, who is uh, behind the scenes over here. But big thanks to the team. Um, but I'm here to introduce Secretary Javier Becerra. Um, and um, before he comes on stage, I just want to say that he and I spent the day yesterday uh, in Birmingham, um, Alabama, talking to women who uh, were affected by the absolutely devastating decision that came down uh, from the Supreme Court of Alabama on IVF. Um, uh, such powerful stories. Uh, it is unclear if Alabama, Alabama wants us to not have pregnancies, whether they want us to have unwanted pregnancies, um, but I think all of this could be expected after the fall of jobs um, that we saw last year. And so um, I know we're going to have a, a powerful conversation today about women's empowerment and reproductive health care and maternal health care, which, by the way, we spent a lot of time talking about yesterday in Alabama as well and trying to um, get their uh, maternal health numbers up. Um, but I want to just say about Secretary Becerra, not only was it a powerful conversation, but um, this is a secretary that shows up to work every day with passion and compassion for all of these issues. Um, he invites us and asks us every day to push the envelope when it comes to healthcare affordability, healthcare access, uh, and healthcare equality. Um, and so I'm just going to pause right here and bring him up on stage. Secretary Becerra. Thank you. 
Jess, thank you very much. And I'm going to pick up on what uh, Jess mentioned about our travels. But first, I have to say uh, to each and every one of you who gave me a chance to shake a hand and give a hug, um, I got some energy now, and I got more energy than I expected. Actually, it is still less than 10 a.m., and you all have a lot of energy. What is going on? That's, this is good stuff. <laughs> it's a good way to start. It's a great way to start. And so thank you all for being here at this Black Health Summit again, not just to celebrate Black History Month, but to do what HHS should be doing every day of the 365 days of the year, and that is celebrating health for all, and that of course includes every one of the Americans who has for many generations had to fight to have access to basic health. So thank you for being here, because this becomes the legacy of HHS to make sure that we remember, not just during a celebration month, but each and every one of the 365 days of the year. I, I guess I have to say something here because I've had a chance. Some of you have know, I've known for a long time. Some of you I'm, I've been getting to know more over these last few years. But I have to tell you, I know you. I know you better than you think because I know what you're trying to accomplish. I know what many of you have gone through. I know why you're here trying to help people who can't be here. But more than that, I think I know from those hugs and those handshakes how important it is to have a session like this that is so focused, that is intentional, that is meant to send a message, especially right now in this crazy time when there are people who are saying we should not learn about our history, our real history, our total history, that there are people who are saying it's time to get rid of DEIA. We haven't even, we barely got started and now they already want to get rid of it. I know you. I know the intentionality behind your being here, especially early in the morning. And so I thank you for being part of what I think is a movement by design. And when I say that, I mean it because design is a very important word for us at HHS. One of the things that I said when I became secretary, and fortunately, it was actually said by people higher up than I, the president of the United States and the vice president, when I said HHS will incorporate equity by design in everything we do, I know I had the support of the people who sit in the White House. And so equity by design is how we now try to operate. And so it should surprise no one that you are here if we're sincere about equity by design. It should surprise no one that today we have a major emphasis at HHS on maternal health if we want to be authentic to equity by design. And it should be less of a surprise for everyone here when we say we are far from done in pushing the envelope when it comes to equity by design. And so I hope that is why you are here, is to join us in this effort. Visiting in Alabama and right before then in Mississippi, it is hard not to believe that you have to be authentic and that you have to push the envelope. Because we were meeting with folks who do general health care as practitioners, as patients, as providers, who are saying they're being squeezed in some parts of the country in their capacity to reach out to folks. They're closing doors instead of opening up opportunities. It is hard to listen as a secretary of HHS that there are parts of our country that are intentionally denying our families with the health care that they need. And so it is even more incumbent upon us to gather here to talk about health, and in particular, black health. And so I want to mention a few things that many of our esteemed colleagues who are here today will mention. You're going to have an opportunity to hear from Mayor Steve Benjamin, 
who is the president's right-hand person when it comes to reaching out to America. Uh, he is here, and I thank him for making the commitment to be here on behalf of the president and the vice president. But more importantly, I thank him for his commitment through his lifetime of activity and uh, advocacy, advocacy to be part of the answer. And here he will be part of that answer, and he brings with him the calling card of the White House for the federal government. And so I thank him for being here. You're going to hear from some of our esteemed colleagues, uh, the administrator of CMS, perhaps the largest uh, maker of rules in America when it comes to health care, one of the most influential agencies in the world, not just in the United States, Chiquita brooks Lashure, who is our administrator, who will speak to you on the work that is ongoing there. Uh, Randa Lynch-Smith, who gives us the data that we rely on to make some of these decisions and to know how to move forward will be part of this process. Dr. Dora Hughes, who has been instrumental in so much of the work that we've done to addressing lack of access when it comes to issues around uh, CMS's work. And I want to thank them for being here. I know that you uh, just mentioned Dr. the Reverend Dr. Q English, who has been instrumental in trying to bring all of us together, not just on health, but recognizing that faith forms part of the solution for health. And I want to say thank you to each and every one of you who took the time to be here. Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is establish equity by design. When we moved to try to get states to give access to women who have just delivered a baby, to more than just 60 days of care within the Medicaid program, we made it very difficult for states to refuse. And today we have a program in place with the help of Congress that lets us partner with states so that they can offer to a woman who has just delivered, who is on Medicaid, 365 days of postpartum care. Because we know that if something is going to happen to mom or baby, it's going to happen within those first three months, more than likely. And the reason we have such high rates of maternal morbidity and mortality in this country, in the richest country in the world, is because we know we don't reach into communities that are desperate for the care, that are yearning to have some provider come to them and say, you're going to have access to care for your new baby and for you. And that is why today 44 states have joined the federal government in extending postpartum care to women on Medicaid, not just for 60 days, but 365 days. And that, yes, it does, that deserves applause. And so applaud loudly because there are still six states who for some reason haven't decided to help their moms and babies have access to the care that they need for 365 days. But we're pushing. We're going to push that envelope. We're pushing the envelope because we know that in getting that care, it's not just the OB that's important, and my, mom, my wife, excuse me, being a, a perinatologist, a high-risk OBGYN, can talk all about that. But it's about the, the nurse, nurses and the midwives, the doulas, who make it possible for someone like my spouse, Carolina Reyes, Dr. Carolina Reyes, to have a chance to help deliver a healthy baby. Because if we don't provide the care up front where it's needed most, and including in the community, not just in a hospital setting, we're not doing what we know we must do. We know that when Frederick Douglass said 160 years ago, it is easier to build strong children to, than to repair broken men. We're waiting to repair broken men and women. It is far easier to make sure that that baby can grow up and be healthy and strong if we're helping that mom before she delivers. And so we intend to help build strong children in America because we don't want to have to repair broken men and women. We know that their focus on equity also requires us to show that we're going to do something a little different. And that's why today I can announce what I couldn't announce a year ago when we did this Black Summit that while I said, I think back then, that we were moving forward with 
innovative therapies that would help communities that have often been left behind. Today, I can tell you that we're actually moving forward with a project. Uh, gene therapy, where the first effort we will undertake in making gene therapy available through HHS auspices will be with sickle cell disease. Because, <laughs> because we now have, we now have within our grasp a cure. Not just treatment, but a cure for sickle cell disease. That's right. It just costs about two or three million dollars for each person to get it. And so how many people here can afford two or three million dollars to get a cure? Why should that cure be out of reach for any American? Especially Americans who for the longest time were at the end of the line to get treatment for a disease that affects more than 100,000 people in this country. At HHS, there are any number of conditions that we could have said, let's zero in. But this is a discrete, discrete population with a new innovation. And here's what we're going to do. Under the auspices of Administrator Chiquita brooks Lashur, CMS is going to try to gather states and say, all of you have populations with sickle cell. Because the greatest number of sickle cell disease uh, Americans is on Medicaid. 60% or so of the population receives Medicaid. They don't get Medicaid for purposes of cure, it's to treat. And some of you know this better than I do. But this is a devastating disease. Year after year after year, it is disabling, it is painful. But now it can be cured. So we're telling every state, let's gather together in partnership. Let us negotiate on all of your population's behalf and let us cut a deal with these manufacturers of these therapies and get the best deal we can. Because at the end of the day, not only are we saving lives and curing people of sickle cell, but we're saving you money because you, you provide treatment to these folks that is not curative, which means lifelong treatment, which probably adds up to more than the cost of the curative treatment. But if we do it together, we can bargain because we have power of numbers behind us and we'll negotiate the best deal. Very simple plan. But life changing for some people who don't have two or three million dollars in their pocket. And so help us get that across the finish line. Make sure that your states are joining in this voluntary effort to try to be able to negotiate with the manufacturers to drive down the price to get the best bargain for those folks who have sickle cell disease and who are on Medicaid so we can get them the best deal possible and let them know that they'll be at the front of the line, not at the back, to get the treatment that's available through America. And so my suspicion is I had you at a low in doing something like that for sickle cell. I had you at a low when it came to in, uh, incorporating doulas in the work that we do. I had you at hello when I said to you that when I took office, I found that the disparities in access to the vaccines was showing already where two-thirds of white adult Americans by May or so of 2021 had received at least one shot, yet less than 50% of black and Latinos who were adults in America had received that first vaccine. Within seven months, eight months, we had erase the disparity so that by January of 2022, more than 90% of white American adults had received at least one vaccine. More than 90% of black American adults had received that vaccine. More than 90% of Latinos had adults had received that vaccine. More than 90% of Asian American and Native American adults had received that vaccine. We were able to erase the disparities that we typically see in America because we were intentional. We went where people were. We didn't wait for them to come to us. That's what equity by design gets you. And that's why when we announced this year that we broke records on signups for Marketplace under the Affordable Care Act, where there are more than 21 million Americans who are now enrolled, almost double what it was before President Biden took office, is because we reached out to the black and Latino communities, the least insured in America. I don't have this 
precise numbers yet to tell you, but I know they're going to be pretty good because last year when we broke records, we got to 16.4 million. We're already at about 16.3, 16.4, I mean 21.3 or 21.4 million for this year. So we not only broke the record of the record of last year, but we broke it by volumes. And that is because we reached out to people who didn't have insurance before. Last year when we broke that record and got to 16.4 million, more than 50% of the people who enrolled were black Americans compared to the previous year. More than 52% of those who enrolled Latinos over the previous year, they broke their own records in coming in as populations. So we know the more we reach out and go to you instead of wait for you to come to us, we're gonna have success. I know you're in that fight too. And so I close by saying this, thank you for giving me some of your energy as I went around and shook your hands and got some, you gotta share some of those selfies, okay? Because uh, everyone always tells me, oh, I, we put it up on, on the internet, I, don't, I never get to see them, but uh, you gotta share some of those photographs. So I can, I can, I can boast as just as you all do. Uh, and I will say this, uh, when I travel throughout the country, not just in my state of California, but to Mississippi and Alabama, we should see equity by design in everything we do. And it is our obligation to make that happen. And my suspicion is you are here because you recognize that equity must be in the design of everything we do. Equity must be in the definition of America. And I close by saying what I said at the very beginning. I trust that it's gonna happen because I trust you. Because as I said, I know you and you know me. Thank you very much for being here today. Jess, I turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary, um, for being here, um, for those remarks, for your steadfast leadership. Um, you heard that passion in his voice. Um, he is so genuine. And he doesn't just trust that it's going to happen. He charges those of us that are here working at HHS with making sure that it happens. And for making sure that we are communicating and engaging you all in this work so that we get it right and that we can address really the structural challenges that we have that stand in the way of black health equity. Up next is a fireside chat entitled The State of Black Health, Where We Are and Where We're Going. We welcome to the stage Kamara Jones, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs, who will lead this discussion. She is an amazing storyteller, um, really is a, a voice for the department, and you're really going to enjoy um, how she engages our incredible panelists. Um, we have Mayor Stephen Benjamin, Senior Advisor and Director of the Office of Public Engagement from the White House. We have Administrator Shakita brooks Lashore, the Administrator from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and Derek Johnson, President of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Please welcome them to the stage. Uh, I'm loud enough on my own, but all right, there we go. There we go. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Hubert Humphrey Building. We're so glad to have you today. We have a power pack panel and we're running a little bit behind and some of us have White House hard stops, so we don't want to miss those. <laughs> Did you say White House hard stop? Yeah. <laughs> there, there's an important meeting, so we're just going to jump right in. Um, uh, and, you know, get to the questions. Uh, one thing I want to say is, um, some of you all know uh, Marvin Figueroa, of uh, show of hands. This is uh, one day we were in the office um, and he said, you know what, I want to do a summit. I want to do a summit. And so that's the result. Today is the result of that. We did one last year, we're back. And so um, as we talk about folks who are doing the work, I just wanted to honor him. Uh, all right. 
The first question is a grounding question. Uh, for a lot of us, Black History Month is a time to reflect. Can each of you reflect on what inspired you to be in your line of work, be it public service or advocacy, and how this choice connects with what's been on your mind this Black History Month? We are going to start in seniority order with Mayor Benjamin. <laughs> is that seniority by age? Is that, sen <laughs> is that seniority by what? Uh, Two Der words, Derek, White House. Derek, Derek and I have been friends for, what, 30-something years? Uh, I was 12. He was 28. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just take it. And, uh, and um, no, the, um, and I say that I, that I said our friendship has been so long just as a foundation, and Shakira and I, we've become dear friends over the last um, uh, recent history. The journey that our people have been on, as the African seed and the American sun is really uh, unlike anything else in the history of the world. And it's allowed me, and I'm, I'm so thankful because at a very young age, uh, I was exposed to men and women who really hadn't uh, been you know, 20 years out uh, of the height of the civil rights movement. And um, they served as, as mentors and, and leaders who poured into me very much the same as what my parents had poured into me, but a sense of not just responsibility, but a sense of gratitude uh, for the labors of, of people, not just those that we celebrate whose names are in lights uh, during Black History Month, but those unnamed foot soldiers who marched, who cried, who died, who really kicked down the doors that many of us, uh, uh, that allowed many of us to sit in these rooms today, you know, free from bombs, free from terror, free from fire. Uh, fighting, uh, able to fight the fight that they were not able to fight. So it's, it's allowed me the, the latitude to keep the fight going, to realize that I'm standing on good, strong, broad shoulders, but also understand that there are a whole lot of people who are standing on my good, strong, broad shoulders, including generations yet on board. So it allows you to, to have a bit of freedom, um, uh, agency, to go and do the work that needs to be done. And I've tried to take that sense of gratitude into every single thing I do uh, in, in, in life, and uh, uh, it's allowed me to, to, to lead a, a career in the public sector, private sector, um, a big, small um, uh, institutions, now uh, from a vantage point at the White House to be able to provide advice and counsel, thoughtful, constructive criticism uh, at, at times that might help inform you know, what's, what I still believe to be the, you know, the greatest um, democratic nation in the history of the world, but it is an ongoing experiment that requires someone, I, I do believe some people, who have the learned experience that, that brings the ancestors along with us. I hope I answered your question. You did. And I looked at my calendar after you said that. I do have a hard stop, but I'm good. I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm exactly where I, where I need to be right now, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Administrator Brooks LaShore. Well, I often say when I talk about this role, it is an honor and a privilege to be in it. And I don't know that I had appreciated being a person of color, a black person, as much as I do, being in this role, because I am here because of people who prayed for me in Mississippi, my in-laws church, to get me through my confirmation process. We are part of a mighty people. All of us who are here are here because we had ancestors who were survivors. And there is such a level of camaraderie and support that is just unique. I am very privileged to sit sandwiched between these two great men who have been such, such supports to me in this role. And I have been very moved in this role how much me being here is meaningful to other women, other people of color, and I take that so seriously. I was thinking, um, when I was a child, I really liked reading biographies. And there was a point where I thought, oh, I'll never be a first. All the firsts will be done by the time I get here. <laughs> and here, lo and behold, I am absolutely the first. And I uh, feel so grateful to be able to be here and to be able to see the underserved in this role. Why did I get into uh, this life of service? Early on in my career, I 
I think I, I grew up in a family, just as Mayor Benjamin said, of men and women who were mission driven. And early in my career, in my uh, graduate school world, really started to understand the disparities in healthcare and how that affects people's ability to really achieve the American dream. I think it is a core, it's, it's baseline for being able to do all of the other things that we talk about, get a good education, live your best life. If you don't have your health, you don't have anything. And I was very inspired by, in the beginning of my career, working on the CHIP program, covering children, and thinking that is a fundamental right of our country to make sure every child in America gets coverage. And that's been the arc of my, my role in, in government and outside of government, of wanting to make, help make people have a card in their pocket that's insurance and make sure that that card is meaningful, that they have access to care. Thank you, Administrator. <laughs> Steve got jokes. Um, I can recall being elementary, going to middle school, and on PBS, a new docu docuseries came out, came out called Eyes on a Prize. And watching Eyes on a Prize, I had an instant reflex when I seen dogs attacking children. I was standing on the couch fighting the air. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. We used to run home to see Coleman Young on the news because we knew if he was going to be interviewed on the news, he was going to cuss that day. <laughs> and like Steve, we migrated New York, him, me, Detroit, from the north to the south and landed in southern states where the civil rights movement that I was watching on PBS was still alive and well. And many of the individuals I seen on that documentary were still actively engaged. And for me, I was shocked, because I was like, they are still alive? And we're still fighting these same fights? And the institution I attended, HBCU Tougaloo College, was known to be a social justice school, so we were encouraged to be involved, and we would have speakers come in. All of those things combined gave me a sense of purpose, that whom much is given, much is required. And that in this thing, this experiment we call democracy, it is not perfect, we have to perfect it. And in and on that drive to perfect it, it is a long road, but at every juncture, the African American community has created that expansive fight that was needed to demonstrate that the social contract we call the Constitution must apply to all people equally. Now, in saying that, this is a fun job because I get up every morning, I can help people. And in helping people, it is the lunch lady who gave me the extra ice cream sandwich. It was the janitor who let me in the school because it was cold outside, the doors were open, and we got that early, he let me in. It was the person who worked at the law school as a security guard who would let us stay an extra 30 minutes when the library was closed. Those are the people we work for. They work every day. They attended the churches we attended, and most of them are overlooked. They're not spoken to. We ignore them. But they are the fabric, the backbone, not only of our community, but this country. And so the work we do is for them. And I am really proud to have someone here who understand and appreciate that. Because the role of government is one in which we post improve the quality of life, and the debate is oftentimes who gets taxed, who's not taxed, and what those tax dollars are spent on. And what we are sitting in the midst of is a fight where the ultra-rich don't want to be taxed to provide for those invisible people that created a space for me to sit in this chair today. One of the things you mentioned is that um, some of these battles are still ongoing, some of the battles of yesterday. Um, I'm a little biased because I'm in public affairs, but 
I think you can judge an organization by its comms, its communications. Um, NAACP knocks it out of the park daily. If you don't follow them, you should. Uh, and in 2020, when we were all, or a lot of us, I should say, most of us were in a rage. I was in a rage um, after the murder of George Floyd. Uh, the NAACP came out with a message that was spot on, uh, which was, we are done dying. Uh, now, most people, when they heard the phrase, they were thinking policing, but it wasn't just policing. Uh, it was a number of things, um, a number of uh, battles uh, against institutional racism that the NAACP was um, going to redouble its efforts against. Can you talk about, uh, President Johnson, um, uh, institutional racism in healthcare? What does that look like for black folks? What are you seeing and hearing on the ground? And what have you maybe experienced yourself? The, uh, the reality of the healthcare system in this country. We tout to be the leading democracy, but we are falling woefully behind other nations as we consider the delivery of quality healthcare. For African Americans, we are far too sick and we die far too soon compared to everyone else. It goes back to tax policy, that when the New Deal was rolled out in the 30s, one of the pieces they were trying to move was universal health care. Germany had already had universal health care some 60 years prior to that. That when you look at even Medicaid and Medicare, it, it wasn't until the great society policies and the, the question of if you, don't, if you accept federal dollars, you must integrate hospitals. That even in this city where the individual who was able to perfect the transfer of blood through blood plasma, he could not get admitted to the very hospitals that was used in his innovation. And as we sit here, there are far too many states where the percentage of where percentage of African Americans live, they still have not expanded the Affordable Care, the Affordable Care Act because they named it Obamacare to create a racialized policy out of it. So when you think about the delivery of health care, when you use the tool of race in the public debate, individuals will actually operate outside of their own personal health interests to deny access to health care to the greater good. But the civil rights movement created a good space. That we think about the civil rights movement about a march on Washington, it was way more than that. A key pillar of the civil rights movement was access to health care. During Freedom Summer, there was a group of doctors who began to recognize that the delivery of health care was as crucial as any other public policy issue. And Dr. Robert Smith, working with Jack Geidner at Tufts, they came up with what we now call federally qualified community health centers. That comes out of the civil rights movement and is still thriving today. So health care is absolutely crucial. Voting rights is, the, is, is a, the paramount right to give access to all the other rights, and right under that is the delivery of quality health care followed by quality education. So I want to bring uh, the administrator into the conversation and the mayor. Um, let's start with you, administrator. From your vantage point, what are some of the challenges we're still facing in health care, and what are we as an administration doing about it? Well, I'll start where President Johnson ended, which is getting to universal coverage is so important for our community, but for the overall American community. And what I think we all should have learned as a country as we went through the COVID-19 pandemic is that if anyone lacks, I don't know if I lost, uh, oh, there, there we go. go. Um, if anyone lacks coverage, we all suffer. It is so crucial that everybody gets care. And I travel around the country and see the differences in states that have expanded Medicaid versus those that have not. And it is very stark in terms of providers and what they are facing, uh, hospitals, doctors being able to get be reimbursed, which is crucial to actually making sure that people have access to care. And that's why we see such different, among other reasons, differences in life expectancy, care for our children, care for our mothers. You can go on and on down the list. This administration, I'd like to say, President 
Biden, Vice President Harris, have taken the baton that President Obama handed to him. So Affordable Care Act has changed millions of people's lives. And during this administration, we have been able to expand coverage so much more broadly, hitting over 21 million people enrolled in the Affordable Care Act marketplaces when 10, 10 years ago in a month, we didn't have anybody where being a woman was a pre-existing condition. And a lot of that is we also have expanded coverage for black and brown people. So this administration has worked so hard to make sure that we're working with trusted community partners who are sometimes better messengers than we are to get the word out, groups like NAACP and so many others who are the ones saying, this is coverage that you can count on. We also continue to urge states to expand Medicaid. Four more states have come in since this administration took office. Postpartum coverage, we're at 43 plus DC. And uh, I like to say the vice president asks me every day when we're getting to 50, we're keeping working to make sure that coverage is expanded. And I'd love to mention that today uh, or this week we have released the CMS health equity page because everything that we do needs to have a health equity focus and we want to make sure that we are telling the story of what uh, what the work of this administration is doing, how important it is to hold on to these gains and not to assume that they will be here if we are not here. And yes, please, please, uh, that deserves a round of applause. So, uh, Mayor Benjamin, from your perspective, uh, what are the challenges that we're still facing and, um, you know, how can we, what are we doing as an administration to solve them? Sure. Now, the challenges, obviously, are, are, are myriad. And, you know, and I know many of you who have been as involved in public life or politics uh, as, as uh, we've been over the last um, several years or decades even, uh, are probably tired of people saying this is the most important election in our lives. Uh, this is the most important election in our, in, our, in our lives. And I say that, obviously, staying on this side of the Hatch Act. Um, but, but it's important to know that um, uh, the elections have consequences, that you know, activism without action is just a conversation, and, and that being involved, and we're here talking about black history uh, and, 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 and black health, but the reality is that, that all these advances that uh, Chiquita and, and Derek just highlighted, the reality is that, is that these advances are advances for humanity. That every uh, underserved, uh, overworked, systemically disadvantaged community benefits from these significant advances that have, that have been achieved over the hard work of the um, uh, organizations like the NACP over decades and the incredible work that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have been able to do and, and, and uh, on the leadership of of uh, uh, Javier Becerra and, and Chiquita, Brooks Asur. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about 21.3 um, million people, you know, have, have, have health insurance. Uh, and, and the possibility, still, you think about that, in 2024, of losing uh, that health insurance. We had a great conference yesterday on, 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 uh, on physical activity and, and, and the hunger, and Congressman McGovern uh, used a quote that hunger, that hunger is a political condition. You know, and the, and the wealthiest, most powerful nation in the history of the world, uh, millions of people can't find their next meal. When you talk about access to um, uh, prescription drugs, and you know, and, and so some people, it, it's still you know academic because we have good uh, health insurance, we have good health coverage, uh, but to hear Congressman Clyburn talk about when Miss Emily uh, was still alive, uh, having to pay eight hundred dollars a month for her insulin. Uh, and, and, and and again, we, we are we are people of privilege. We're all blessed and uh, and able to sit in, in this room right now. Um, but reducing that to, to thirty five dollars a month, the difference that's made in people's lives, uh, the um, and at risk of potentially losing that uh, is 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 very real. I hear Sister Janice Poirier. I remember we had, we hosted a, a session um, uh, just last month to talk about the, the fact that it was more. And prior to this administration, the leadership of folks like, uh, like Jaquita and, and Javier and, and so many of you in this room, it was cheaper for her to fly to Paris to get her drugs and fly back to the United States. 
but now that she has an administration and the president fighting 10 drugs at a time to lower the cost of access to life-saving uh, drugs that she needs and that she deserves, and they don't cost anywhere close to what uh, folks are having to pay for it here. I mean, it's, it's just so important that we, um, that we understand the gains that have been made and that we all kind of have to be involved in doing the work that we're doing. These, you are all trusted community partners that have um, um, more currency and relationships and validity uh, sometimes than any politician who, who walks in the room. And just making sure that, that we're encouraging people to stay very, very involved in the, in the process of, 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 of preserving uh, and protecting uh, this, um, uh, this democracy and the advances that we made together. So we're very proud of the advances. The, the reality is that still there's so much more work uh, to be done, so much more work to be done, and we've just got to make sure we're able to, um, to finish the job. So I love that you mentioned um, hunger and nutrition because um, some of you know that the Secretary has really been pushing food as medicine, uh, and he's been doing that uh, with um, communities of color in mind, you know, folks who are disproportionately uh, affected by diabetes and other diet-related diseases. So um, I wanted to mention that because so often we talk about coverage. Um, there's other things we're doing beyond coverage. The other thing I wanted to mention is um, a lot of folks don't think of us as having a, a civil rights sort of focus, but we uh, were part of an enforcement action in Lowndes County, Alabama, which I know President Johnson's well aware of. They have a history of voter suppression. Um, we also had, you know, black folks with sewage in their yard, and so we were part of an enforcement action to, to end that because that is a health issue. Um, let's keep going because we just have a few more minutes. Um, so I can, you know, personally attest to the fact uh, that the administration has been working around the clock. Uh, I, I uh, often go to sleep with my light on uh, because of it. Um, but there's a gap often between what is being done on behalf of the black community and the community itself. So I want to um, start with you, Mayor Benjamin. How do we close that gap? You know, making sure black folks are aware of what we're doing, they know how to take advantage of it um, when it comes uh, to engagement. Sure. No, I think obviously you mentioned the NACP's comms uh, operation, which is incredibly effective, and a lot of it's because of I think the way Derek uh, and his team sees the world. They see that uh, connectivity. And right now, and, I, and I'll, I know we have just a few minutes left, so I'll be very brief. Right now, it, it's really just time to flood the zone, y'all. You know, the, the days are over when, when three guys who, who looked alike popped up on the news at 6.30, told you all the news that was, that was, that was you know, fit to, to print. You got something different from your shock jock in the morning, and maybe you got something from your newspaper or record or, or Ebony or Jet. Uh, those days are over. When literally, as we're sitting here in this room right now, well over 100,000 emails and text messages and social media hits will hit all of our boxes uh, just in, in a half hour or whatever much time we had here. So it's so important that we be everywhere sharing the good news, trusted sources, and, and, and serving as the messengers to push the information out. We, uh, if, you ha if you're not signed up for the White House um, Office of Public Engagement seminars and webinars and, and, and newsletters, one person signed up, really? Okay. Uh, all right, all right. You know, I mean, but all the, the information is being pushed out. I, I hope and pray that we all step into our role of responsibility to push this information out. I mean, let me, let me tell you what, and I, and I know we haven't spoken about it specifically, but you mentioned Alabama. This assault on women's health, this assault on your agency. I'm not a woman, uh, but I'm married to a strong black woman with two beautiful little girls in my house. They, they're young women uh, in, my, in my household. My wife tells me every day uh, uh, that, um, that she's the best thing that ever happened to me, and I, 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 agree, I agree with her. Um, but the, um, this blatant offense, and if we don't kind of realize uh, the, the, the importance of being active, involved, and not, sometimes not even waiting for the, for, for the White House or, or CMS or, or uh, the NACP to step up and realize our own power, our own individual power and responsibility to step up and make sure the good news is spread, then I would, I would encourage you to, to lean in right now because uh, the, the, the future is not clear for a lot of folks. President Johnson, anything to add on closing the engagement gap? Yeah, net of control is important. I said earlier, the real debate is who's tax, who's not, how tax dollars are spent. Race becomes the tool to divert attention. Think about building a wall. I am so glad they not, didn't build a wall on the border. 
because the people that I know in Detroit was going to Canada to buy medicine because it was so much cheaper. But we talk about building a wall only because it's something in, on the southern border when in fact far too many Americans was driving to Canada for, for their medicine. Thank God for the political decision that was made in 2020. Now insulin is much, much cheaper. That decision impact auto workers in Detroit because there was a gap in their coverage. So that's how they will go to Canada buy their, their stuff. Steve made the comment that hunger is a political decision. That's the last time we're going to attribute that to him. I'm using it from now on, right? <laughs> advocacy is absolutely crucial. And they see we're advocacy group, not a service provider. When people are hungry, yes, you set up a soup kitchen, but the real question is, what are the policies that's creating the hunger that, that, that's requiring the soup kitchen to exist? And so narrative control becomes important. The democratization of media is really crucial. Lies spread fast, but if we can create the right center of gravity to be trusted messengers, wherever we sit, black, white, green, or yellow, then we can actually move the political conversation so hunger don't exist and delivery of health care can be provided to all citizens and its quality. So a round of applause for that. Um, we have come to the end of the panel, and um, I'm going to change the last question a bit. Um, this is a time to offer closing remarks. And as you do, uh, two things to think about. Uh, folks who um, attend uh, panels like this, who are here now with us, um, they often say, well, what can I do to help? Um, how can I jump in? Also, too, uh, there's a lot of things we are talking about, but there are a lot of things we aren't talking about. So as you think about your closing remarks, how can folks jump in and help? And then what's, uh, what's not on our radar, maybe, that should be? Uh, I'll start with uh, the administrator. Well, just to say, I think we, as the administration, are trying to do everything we can to get the word out about what we are doing and how we are trying to move the needle. And we've talked about, we've touched on several of them, but it could go on and on. And I urge you to look at our websites, look at what we're putting out, and tell us to do more, which I know you all will do in terms of what more we need to do, be engaged, uh, and know that we're, as always, you know, the government is limited. But we are so dedicated to trying to make sure that we are doing a good job communicating, and all we hear is just how hard it is to break through the narrative. So we just urge all of you to, to do what the mayor and what President Johnson have said about be engaged. Uh, there okay. we go. All politics are still local. So doing your work in your community, grassroots politics work, and now we have the power of social media and the internet to connect with people who may not live in our neighborhood, but who are listening to our, our messages. So remember that. And on this journey, I'll say this in, in maybe 15 seconds, y'all remember to take care of yourselves too. You can't take care of other people if you aren't taking care of yourselves, okay? So just, just uh, lean in, do the, do the work, but this, your, your physical health, this one temple God gives us, your mental health, your emotional health, your spiritual health, take care of yourselves while you're taking care of other people. And it's amazing how much more powerful your message will be. <laughs> we have a lot of call and response today, which I love. Um, let's close out with President Johnson. I would say amplify successes and be weary of re around repeating false narratives. Amplify successes, be weary around repeating false narratives. People are looking to us, everyone in this room, for validation and clarity about what's in, what's in our best interest. So continue to amplify. This administration has done a great job. A lot of more work to do, but they've done a great job. So let's begin to amplify those successes. <laughs> That concludes our panel. Uh, enjoy the rest of the forum, and um, we'll see you on uh, social media and elsewhere. Thank you.
I got it. I got it. All right, we, we have no breaks. Please do take advantage of the coffee and the water, but we're gonna keep the conversation going. But thank you so much for the powerful discussion that we just had um, from the panel. I heard, a, I heard them challenging us to be good messengers, to amplifying our success locally and at the national level, and staying in community with each other to challenge us to continue to do better. So I'm very excited to welcome to the stage next an important young voice among healthcare providers, Dr. Rachel Burwell. Dr. Burwell will provide a keynote address focused focus on addressing racial bias in healthcare. Um, already, um, as a young leader, her bio is very long. I will just give you a taste. Dr. Burwell is a physician, creator, and advocate deeply committed to serving vulnerable committees and addressing uh, vulnerable communities and addressing medical disparities. Uh, Dr. Burville co-produced a nationally acclaimed podcast series investigating solutions to the black maternal health crisis, is advising the Baltimore City, Baltimore City Health Department as it raises awareness of mental health among women and children, and has overseen the development of equity-focused curricula at various medical schools, among other activities. Please help me welcome Dr. Burville to the stage. Good morning, everybody. Perfect, I love it. I'm so glad to be here this morning to talk to you a little bit about how we can connect to one another. You know, just this morning on my way here, I checked my notifications on Instagram and I saw one from a user, a message. I love your page, she wrote. And she went on to describe a post a recent one that I had shared earlier this week from my Instagram platform. The post was an image with a simple message that black women deserve healthy birthing experiences. That post had resonated with her. Inspired by that call to action, she had a simple question for me. She said, I just found out I'm pregnant. Can you please connect me to a black OBGYN? And I did. While this connection might not seem revolutionary, it's actually my hope that she will find someone who will meet her where she is. And she will eventually have more equitable health care. You see, I run a page called the Black OBGYN Project. And amidst the usual inquiries, I frequently receive messages just like this. And they always stand out. They're messages from black women who are reaching out in the hopes of being heard, seen, and protected, especially in light of the stark realities of racial disparities and reproductive health care, something that you all will go into a little bit later this morning. When I launched the Black OBGYN project in the spring of 2019, I did so wanting to actually stay connected to the community of black reproductive health providers who are around the nation as we embarked on our residency training. Despite being 15% of the US population, black providers only make up 5% of the physician workforce. This was actually my way of highlighting these amazing and incredible superheroes. So over the past five years, with the publication of numerous educational materials, as you kind of heard to alluded, and different guides on how to advocate for yourself for self-empowerment, especially when you're in clinical settings, and nearly 32,000 followers later, my Pages community has grown. And I've honestly witnessed this noticeable increase in discourse, a noticeable concerted effort that's aimed at bettering reproductive health care, especially as it affects black birthing individuals. And that growth via my platform, it's focusing on maternal and reproductive health care amidst these significant societal changes. I have to admit to you, those changes are not all positive. Right. 
Just last summer, actually, and I'm a physician, so I like to look at um, the Journal of American Medical Association's uh, publications, there were staggering findings that maternal deaths doubled between 1999 and 2019, excluding the pandemic spike, and it affected every state and every demographic. In 2019 alone, there were over 1,200 maternal deaths that occurred compared to 505 in 1999. And that toll is not equally distributed across all the ethnic and racial demographics. You see, black women share the brunt of this. Black women are constantly bombarded with statistics and stories that reflect the inequities of healthcare as it relates to them specifically. It's in the eye-opening CDC announcements, I don't have to tell you all here, that are revealing the alarming truth that black women are three to four times more likely to die in, from pregnancy-related complications than their white counterparts. It's in the alarming headlines that are delving into the daunting statistics for black morbidity among black patients, a reality that even Serena Williams and Beyonce herself could not avoid. It's referred to as the black maternal health crisis and it's a damning indictment of our healthcare system, considering the fact that maternal health is a bellwether for all other aspects of healthcare. Black individuals face disparities across the healthcare spectrum from increased cancer outcomes and access to mental health care. And further, articles are constantly emphasizing the fact that there's a pervasive issue of discrimination in health care, with surveys indicating that black patients actually feel undermined when they're with a health professional like myself. And just last week, the Commonwealth Foundation, or the Commonwealth Fund, excuse me, showed that nearly half of healthcare workers have witnessed racial disparities against patients. You know, this is a crisis, and what they've called it is that it's racism. That's the true crisis. So when a follower direct messaged me asking for help in finding a black provider, it's in response to the urgent need to address these disparities. While I am committed, and I know everyone in this room is committed to advancing health equity, I need to be candid. Actually, we all need to be candid about how we arrived to this point in order to change the narrative. As we reflect on the troubling realities that are illuminated in these statistics, it's imperative that we actually delve into the historical underpinnings that shape the landscape of healthcare disparities faced today. And we have to remember that that connection has to be made in order for us to move forward. So I'm going to take a little bit of time to go through that. The roots of racial disparities actually run deep. I don't have to tell you all here that they run through the centuries of systemic injustices and discrimination, from the brutal legacy of slavery, where black bodies were exploited for medical experimentation without consent, to the era, era of Jim Crow laws, where segregation was enforced even within our healthcare facilities. The scars of the present are reflections of the scars made from the past. I'm gonna give you a couple examples. Consider with me for a moment Dr. James Marion Sims. I don't know how many of you have recognized that name, but he's often heralded as the father of gynecology. His groundbreaking surgical techniques to repair what we call a vesicovaginal fistula, it's a condition that's often debilitating for women, um, was perfected through experiments performed on enslaved black women. And while he only named three of the women he operated on in his writings, because he wrote an autobiography about it, Anarcha, Betsy, and Lucy, he callously performed these vaginal and pelvic surgeries without the help of anesthesia on dozens and he dismissed their pain as inconsequential under the false pretense that black people could feel and could not feel pain and could endure more. His egregious exploitation of humanity laid the foundation for medical practices and actually has perpetuated a dehumanizing, dehumanizing approach to black bodies. It's a legacy that is disturbingly still present today. A 2017 paper that was published in the Proceedings of National Academy actually underscores this. They surveyed 222 medical students, um, and about half of those, medical students and residents, endorsed false biological differences between blacks and whites. Those that endorsed those 
felt that blacks felt less pain, that they had thicker skin, and these harmful misconceptions and implicit biases of the providers influenced their eventual decision making. In some cases, within the realm of medical education and training more broadly, the pervasive biases and stereotypes have also been codified in practice. For example, there are race-based scoring adjustments to evaluate almost every patient in every specialty in modern medicine. And in every case, from kidney disease to heart disease, these adjustments can actually cause more harm to patients who are non-white. Because despite amid, um, lots of evidence that race is a social construct and it is not biological, these corrections are actually based on the long debunked premise that there are innate biological differences among races. At least for our part as clinicians, we're trying our best to remove some of these algorithms to prevent people of color from seeing harm. Lastly, I want you to think about the example of redlining, an insidious practice that affected the financial services that you could get to secure housing and to live in a community in a neighborhood. You know, I went to school, I went to Harvard for undergrad, and when I lived in Boston, Massachusetts, I saw this for myself as I journeyed on the MBTA number one bus from Harvard Square all the way down to Roxbury's Nubian Square, what used to be called Dudley. When you make that three mile journey from the start to the end, you know the median household income decreases by nearly $50,000. Those communities of colors that were locked out so many de decades ago from opportunities for wealth accumulation is only a part of the problem because redlining affects health too, from the development of illness itself. For instance, in the once redlined community of West Oakland, residents grapple with asthma rates that are five times higher than that in the state of California. And that has led to troubling outcomes as a result of the pollution that is in the near board by Oakland ports and highways that redlining said was appropriate. So acknowledging this fraught history, it's not just an exercise of retrospective analysis. It's actually a moral imperative for everybody here in this room. It compels us to confront the uncomfortable truths that are embedded within our healthcare system and to reckon with the, the profound implications of our collective past on the present and the future of healthcare delivery. It also gives us an idea and an area that we can tackle and opportunities that we can implement meaningful change. So awareness alone, like I've given you this morning, is not enough. It needs to be accompanied by action a commitment to dismantling the structural barriers and systemic injustices that perpetuate healthcare disparities, and we need to demand accountability from our institutions, policymakers holding them responsible to address the racial inequities in healthcare and ensure that equitable access and quality for all maintains itself. From the grassroots movements, advocating for healthcare equity, which you'll hear about in just a moment, to policy initiatives, we need to embrace a shift towards recognizing and rectifying systemic injustices within healthcare. And while we're here in Washington, I do just want to say that action is happening. We have the Black Maternal Health Caucus in Congress, the Momnibus from Representative Alma Adams to Representative Lauren Underwood, the White House's blueprint for addressing maternal health crisis. These are just a few of the efforts that are underway, but we can do more. So advocating for policies, promoting diversity and inclusion within the healthcare workforce, we can create a more equitable and responsive healthcare system, regardless of race or ethnicity supporting and uplifting the healthcare professionals that are there for more diversity, having culturally concordant care where patients receive healthcare from providers who share a background like they come from. It has been shown to improve patient satisfa satisfaction, trust, and health outcomes. Whether she knew it or not, that faller this morning was getting at just that. And while we recruit for more diversity, we need to educate all our health providers on rectifying and identifying and addressing implicit bias and also fostering an inclusive and respectful environment where patients feel heard, valued, and empowered in healthcare decisions. That type 
of investment in cultural humility, humility should be paramount. In the words of Loretta Ross, we need to grab a broom and clean where you are. Ultimately, we have the power to change the narrative in our willingness to confront injustice, in our ability to amplify marginalized voices, to advocate for policy, knowing that the consequences are long-term, just like the consequences of history. We need to challenge bias and discrimination within our own spheres of influence, support initiatives that advance health equity. Through our connections, connecting with each other, with diverse perspectives, with the communities we serve, we harness the strength to affect real change. Together, we have the knowledge, the resources, and the moral imperative to build a more just, equitable healthcare system, one that will continue to affirm the dignity, autonomy, and the inherent worth of every individual. Thank you so much, and I hope with that, you take something away to connect with someone else. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Baravel. Thank you for your inspirational um, talk, your inspirational service, not just as a physician, but um, connecting the dots for us and connecting black mothers with providers who can best help them have a great pregnancy and birth. Um, you know, when I was uh, preg pregnant with uh, my two daughters over 20 years ago now, I had to search high and low for the provider that I knew I wanted. I was in search of the black nurse midwife to deliver my child. And I live here in the DMV area, and I found two of them. One about 35 minutes away from me, another 90 minutes away from me. I was so fortunate to have um, good federal health insurance that covered those black nurse midwives that I was searching for. I had the good government job that allowed me the time to do the research to find those folks and to take leave so that I could visit a midwife um, for my care um, before I gave birth and up to a year after I delivered. Um, everyone is not as fortunate as me. I had such an amazing experience with um, my black nurse midwife provider. Um, and my kids actually still visit her today. Um, I know that our conversants today on our next panel will help highlight how we can ensure that others have that really positive birthing experience, um, a, a positive experience through their reproductive and motherhood journey, whatever it would be. So please um, help me welcome to the stage the Reverend Dr. Q English, the director of the HHS Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships, who will lead the discussion. Dr. English is joined by our incredible panelists, Dr. Dora Hughes, acting chief medical officer and acting director of the Center for Clinical Standards and Quality in CMS. Dr. Rachel Villanueva, clinical assistant professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine and former president of the National Medical Association, and Alexia Dumboya, president and certified doula of CocoLife.Black. Please welcome to the stage our panel. So thank you, Miranda. So glad to see many of here, us here today. And while we celebrate a month dedicated to black history, we celebrate who we are every single day. But yet in the midst of celebration, there's a reality that we can't escape, a cloud that creates a pause as we deal with the reality of healthcare inequities and racism and cultural incompetency and lack of cultural humility that exist. And the blatant disregard for human beings whose color is sun-kissed. So today, the United States still has the highest 
maternal mortality rate than any developed nation in the world still, and black women's pregnancy-related deaths are three to four times higher than white women. But what you need to know is that here at the United States Department of Health and Human Services, under the leadership of the Honorable Secretary Javier Becerra, we are not ostriches in the sand. We see, we know, we hear, and we hear you, and we act. 44 states plus the District of Columbia and the Virgin Islands extended Medicaid postpartum coverage from 60 days to one year. This administration and Health and Human Services have proposed and released more funding related to maternal health than any prior administration. For example, in the fall, HRSA released $90 million to expand access, support the workforce, and expand screening and treatment options for maternal mental health. Our maternal mental health hotline, 24-7, you can call or text. And if you don't know it, I encourage you to write it down, 1-833-TLC-MAMA. That's 1-833-TLC-MAMA. And on December 15, 2023, Health and Human Services, through the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, announced innovative actions to improve maternal health and birth outcomes for pregnant and postpartum women and their infants through the new transforming maternal health model. And one of the things we have done at the Partnership Center where I am honored to direct is we launched the Moms Tour in the latter part of 2023. It's the Maternal Health Outcomes Matter Shower. We went to the communities with high maternal mortality or morbidity rates and we connected pregnant and postpartum women along with fathers and fathers-to-be and children with needed resources and services. We connected them to the village they didn't even know existed. We served over 5,000 women, connected over 1,700 women to mental health services, over 500 to health care coverage, over 800 to doula support service, and worked with organizations to increase the doula workforce by certifying almost 200 African-American doulas. That's success. And we plan to do even more in 2024. And if you'd like to collaborate, do see me after. So here today, we're going to talk about black maternal health, empowering black mothers, improving ma maternal mental health outcomes, what more we can do, what more you can do. Our goal, and I believe it's our collective goal, is to see the United States become one of the safest places for women to give birth. So right now, I'm going to join our expert panelists who has something to say, and they are ready, just like I am, to kick off this discussion. Let's give them a hand. Okay. This is great. This is a, uh, this is a panel of dynamic, powerful voice, voices. So first, I would like to ask each of them to introduce themselves. And after your formal introduction, tell us why you are in this space. Why this? What's your driving force? Could you share a personal story or experience that has shaped your commitment to addressing black maternal health disparities? Let's start with Alexia. Hello, everyone. Good morning. So Alexia Dumboya, certified doula, as they said, and president of CocoLife.Black. I am so thankful to be here. A lot of my why is driven by that personal experience that I had, particularly on the side of maternal mental health challenges. So about 12 years ago, I was thrust into this space not understanding what it really meant to suffer from postpartum depression psychosis and severe anxiety. I did not have the language for it then. I just knew that I felt like a horrible mother. I knew I was struggling. I knew I could not figure out why I could not connect with this person that I just carried for nine months and then birth. And I felt alone. I did not want to share my experiences because I was very familiar with what family surveillance looks like in the black community. So I was terrified that someone was going to try to take my child as well. Um, I knew that I needed help, but what did help look like and where do you go and how do you have these conversations? Because in my family, we didn't really discuss it. It, it was very much so, you know, we keep our laundry at home and we don't, it's, it's just a part of being um, pregnant or having a child. 
And so what I quickly realized is that I wasn't alone. I quickly realized as I started talking to, just starting with my own internal community of village, the experiences of loss, the experiences of mental health challenges, and that feeling of isolation. I said, okay, let's create a community. Let's cultivate a community where we can serve each other. And that is what birthed Coco Life. As time went on, I also learned that there was this role of a doula that I could step up in. And I always considered myself my sister's keeper, but this was a place where I can intentionally do the work. I could intentionally serve. And so I took my gifts that I had through the corporate experiences, working in healthcare and health plan systems, and I said, let's develop a way that we can provide more moms, more dads with, these, with this work of a doula. And so that is my why. And what keeps me here is the opportunity to help others to bridge that gap into this space. Hi, good, <clears throat> gosh, good morning. I'm COVID negative, I tested, so if you hear me coughing, don't be worried. Um, I'm, I'm Dr. Rachel Villanueva, Rachel, I go by, um, and I'm an OBGYN, I practice in New York City, and um, I served as the 122nd president of the National Medical Association, and for those of you not familiar, the NMA represents black physicians across the country. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Um, we were founded in 1895. I had a reporter ask me during my presidency if we were founded as a result of the COVID epidemic. And I said, yes. I said, no, sir. We were founded because the American Medical Association would not let black physicians practice and black patients could not go to hospitals and get care. And so that's what the NMA was founded on. Uh, we took care of health disparities before they, the term health disparities was coined. Right, so we've been taking care of the black community for a very long time. Um, my why really started from, right, the why of most doctors want to just help people, right? We, we go into medicine to help people. I think as an undergraduate and medical student in New Haven, I really became more keenly aware of the disparities in our community and how it affected the way people were treated at the hospital and how lack of education affected the community and access. And so even as a student, I really became committed to medical student in the Student National Medical Association and uh, being committed to students of color, uh, being uh, nurtured and being educated and flourishing because we have a real problem with the lack of physicians of color in our community and we need to make that, we need to address that. So that's, that's where it started. With maternal health as a resident in New York City, the disparities I saw between how a clinic patient and a private insured, privately insured patient was treated, it was, I don't, it, it really, it leaves you at a loss. It leaves you at a loss when you're operating and the attending physician starts talking about a black patient and says, and then looks at me and realizes I'm black <laughs> and realizes like, oh, well, but you're different from that person. And having said that to me, and I think you're just shocked. You don't know what to say. You really don't know how to react. And I think all of these experiences have made me very sensitive to ensuring that our community gets the best care, gets access, um, that we are not left behind. Because we've been talking about black people and minoritized populations, uh, poor health care in the United States for decades. This is not new. We've been, HHS has been documenting this for decades, right, since the 80s. Why just someone, because of their skin color, why do they get poor care? Do they get poor interactions in a hospital uh, or with a provider? So I think each along my journey, I've become more and more committed. Um, and I think finally, I think as a practicing OBGYN, um, I've seen a dramatic increase of women of color coming to me to get care and coming to me saying, um, thank you for listening to me. Uh, uh, with tears in their eyes saying, no one actually explained to me what this diagnosis meant. She told me to go look, she told me to Google it. 
Um, and so just realizing that in this age where we really have so much, like in, in the United States where there's such great health care, we still as a community are suffering poor health outcomes, poor care um, in a health system that was not made for us. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, uh, that's my driver. Sorry, very long driver. No, I, I appreciate, I love that you just jumped right into the policy matters here, and there's so much that I hope that we can touch on as part of this conversation. I want to start by thanking you for inviting me to join the panel today. Uh, again, I'm Dr. Dora Hughes. I'm the Acting Chief Medical Officer at the Centers uh, for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And I'm also the Acting Director for the Center for Clinical Standards and Quality. Uh, in terms of personal experience, I would say I started off at early in my career focusing on health equity uh, by participating in the Commonwealth Fund, Harvard University Fellowship in Minority Health Policy. A very strong name and a strong title, and I look at my colleagues, uh, Dr. Shairi Turner, who also participated in that same fellowship, uh, dare I say decades ago, I don't want to date us, but many, many, many moons ago at this point. Um, but at that point, that's when I first became aware of uh, the black maternal health crisis is part of all of the different disparities and, uh, and issues that we're facing uh, our patients of color. Um, certainly, I would say uh, in my 30s, as uh, I started, I got married, started having my own family, had my own experience. And it was really sobering around that time as I, uh, many of my friends were also starting their own families. At one point, I realized I didn't have a single friend who had a quote unquote normal, uncomplicated vaginal delivery. And I have many friends. And so it was kind of in that context where you learned about it academically, theoretically, you start to invest in uh, initiatives at a distance as part of your work, but then when it really hits home for uh, your personally, your family, your friends, your colleagues, uh, and you start to truly appreciate just uh, what it means to each person individually and what the impact it is on their health, uh, their, um, uh, their families. It's just really, just really devastating that to find us that we're still here, uh, having the same conversation. Um, uh, but at the same time, though, I think much of the work that we're doing at the federal level certainly gives me hope. Uh, and I'm certainly looking forward to discussing a bit more of that through the conversation uh, today. So thank you so much again. Thank you, thank you. So this question in the next two minutes, Dr. Rachel, Alexia, from your perspective as obstetrician, gynecologist, and doula, we're hearing today, we're hearing about classism, racism, morbidity issues, lack of access, lack of people of color in the health community, but what are some of the common healthcare challenges specifically faced by black women during pregnancy and childbirth? Dr. Rachel? Um, I think uh, for, for me to discuss, we're not, I, I'm not gonna discuss challenges as far as medical challenges. I'm gonna try to broaden it to the challenges that we face in the healthcare system. And I think that um, it, we really can't underestimate how much uh, implicit bias and racism affects our interactions and our health and our outcomes within the healthcare system. And I think discussing it seems sort of very esoteric, but it's not. When you think of the interactions that women will have um, with a particular provider and how, whether they are given um, appropriate uh, treatment plans, what treatment plans they're offered, uh, whether they are, um, whether they themselves will continue care because they've had a poor interaction or they, they're, um, they see their provider as not um, providing them with the best care that they can have. So I think those issues, the most difficult issues really in society for us to deal with, are really affecting our maternal health outcomes in our community. 
whether it's our ability to access care, the quality of care that we're getting, our ability to comply with that care. Um, racism and stress affect black women down to the cellular level. It affects our, um, you know, our telomeres. Uh, they, it affects our ability, our biological age. Women age more, are, are said to age more in, the, in weathering. Right? Chronic stress from racism, from stress in the community. Um, so all of these things down to a cellular level affect our ability to, to even have children because we are biologically aged further along than our, our companions, white counterparts. I think some of the challenges too are based in the history of black women in our society and the challenges of seeing black women as not as um, providing black, sorry, providing black women with the support that they need and not, um, and upholding black voices. I think for black women, we have a history of forced sterilization. We have a history of um, even procedures being done on us unanesthetized. That history is not so long ago. Um, I think we kind of think that in our modern age, things should, just should progress as, you know, everyone's treated the same, but black, our black experience has been in racial oppression for a very long time. And I think we really have to think about when the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, we're only 60 years past that. And so how we are treated in the healthcare system is very much tied to that history and not forgetting that history is important as we move forward. Mm. Alexia. So Dr. Dr. Rachel and I had a chance to pregame because she said everything I was just about to say. Uh, no, that's perfect. Because what I just want to, as she talked at the, at the broad level, what that looks like if you think about your own experience or the experience of others, we've seen the diagrams that talk about the impact through intergenerational trauma, that racialized trauma and how it's passed down, right? You see the picture of the womb with the baby in it and a, a baby within the baby, if you will. Because what we notice is that things get passed down other than just our looks and other other things beyond that. And so what we see as challenges are often a space that doesn't acknowledge that too. So we have to take the time to acknowledge that this person who is sitting in front of me, whether they look exactly like me or not, there may be some additional baggage or things or impact influences that they're carrying into this space. And so as a doula, one of my responsibilities there is to help to bridge those relationships. We talked about, as Dr. Rachel mentioned, the systemic issues and things that are facing, and that implicit bias is what leads to mistreatment. And some of the data that the World Health Organization shared is that one in six women, black women in particular, stated feeling mistreated, feeling unheard feeling like they had a loss of autonomy. That doesn't have anything to do with your medical condition. That has to do with, do you see me? Are we creating a sense of belonging? We know that time is of the essence and you may have a lot of patients or people that need to be seen. And so then the system is failing our practitioners that do want to provide that quality of care because statistics, uh, the metrics that are selected are creating an environment where you can't truly support. So when you think about challenges in the health system, are we creating a space of belonging? When I come into, it's not just access, it's what happens when I get there. I'm from the Philadelphia area, you can throw a stone and hit about five or six different teaching hospitals and institutions. What happens when I walk into that door? Do you see me for the opportunities that I bring or do you look at me even just as marginalized and, and the deficits that you think come with it? And so those are some of the challenges I think that we are addressing um, in a way that will help to bridge the gap between the clinical experiences and also what those influences of SDOH or social determinants of health also bring, like we heard shared, mm -hmm. housing impacts. Your, your birthing experiences. When we look at the preterm birth rate, it's much, it's significantly higher for black women. And when you start to dig down deep into it, it's not only just those things of how are we taking care of ourselves from a health perspective, but what were the things that influenced um, those outcomes too? 
We're going to do a deeper dive and because I really want to talk through some of the solutions in that space. I'm going to turn it now to uh, Dr. Hughes. What initiatives, we'll, we'll hit the policy right now, what initiatives or policies are currently in place to address disparities in maternal health outcomes among black mothers? Uh, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I'll speak from the vantage of CMS, so that, again, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, and even, even though I know uh, you've had uh, a number of panels, I, I do still just want to share just a couple of stats to ground the conversation. Uh, one, as our colleagues from the Centers for Disease Control uh, published in 2021, of every 100,000 live births, 33 women die uh, from childbirth complications. And we know that that number is even higher for black and brown uh, uh, women who are delivering. Uh, the other stat I also want to share is that Medicaid, uh, which is uh, run by CMS in partnership with the states, uh, support 40% of all births in this country, which is extraordinary. Uh, just in terms of the number of beneficiaries that we have a responsibility for, the number of beneficiaries that we, that we serve, but also the opportunity to implement changes uh, that can ripple across all of the states uh, and localities um, all across the nation. Uh, and so with that, that vantage, this, the numbers themselves, the number of births that we cover, CMS has long invested in maternal health initiatives. And I have to give a shout out to my colleagues in the Center for Medicaid and CHIP Services. Uh, they certainly have been at the leading edge for uh, deploying interventions, really trying to provide the technical assistance, uh, the funding support to states to help. Um, but um, all of our centers, all of our components, particularly under our administrator, Chiquita brooks Lashore, and particularly with this administration, uh, we all understand it's all hands on deck. And so I'll share a little bit of uh, well, maybe I'll continue with our colleagues in Medicaid. As, I, as Q mentioned, we are so, uh, we're so excited that the 44th state uh, is um, now ex expanding uh, postpartum coverage to pregnant women uh, as the fourth trimester. We know what an impact that will have. Um, but if I talk about the focus a bit on the CMS Innovation Center, our experimental research arm at CMS, uh, we too have had some significant investments over the past years. Uh, for many of you may be familiar with our strong start model about 10 years ago, a little bit less than that. And that was the first large scale foray uh, by the CMS Innovation Center into maternal health. We wanted to see how the outcomes, what would the outcomes be, particularly for women of color, if they receive their maternity care uh, from the midwifery model, midwives, uh, if we uh, receive it through traditional maternal home models, uh, more in the healthcare system, uh, if we tested the centering models. Uh, and what we learned, and I think this piggybacks very much on the earlier comments, is that as we address the clinical care, uh, through these other models, we're better able to listen to moms, we're able to hear, address their non-clinical needs, which in some cases may have an even greater impact on their outcomes. Uh, and so with the learnings from the Strong Start model and the direction leadership uh, by uh, more recent administrations, uh, a few years ago we launched the MOM model, Maternal Opioid Misuse Model. And in this case, we really focus on, as the name suggests, uh, those with um, opioid use addiction, uh, those populations highly vulnerable uh, and with uh, potential for very negative outcomes for, for the mom and certainly for the baby. And in this model, we purposely try to bridge clinical and social uh, interventions. Can we address the social needs? Can we make sure that we help them stay in treatment through the duration of their pregnancy and, and afterwards? That one is still underway, and uh, as Q mentioned, we just announced another model, uh, really taking from all that we've learned, uh, the Transforming Maternal Health model, which uh, the uh, funding and applications will come out a little bit later in the spring. Uh, but this one is really important because, in this case, the CMS Innovation Center is partnering with Medicaid together, uh, and we will be working with states States really need to be at the front uh, because they know the populations they serve. They know the issues that need to be addressed. Is it transportation? Do we have limited English proficient populations? Uh, they really know the local partners who can help us deliver. 
Uh, and so with us on the federal side, providing very uh, targeted funding support, providing intense technical assistance, uh, thinking through what the payment model could be, uh, partnering with states as they develop their own interventions, form their own plans. We think, uh, particularly at the scale that we intend to do it, uh, that we will uh, be successful, hopefully, um, at moving the needle. So those are so, just a few examples. I'll stop there and I'll pick back up, uh, maybe share a little bit more, uh, depending on the questions that come up. That sounds good. And yes, we have truly, and, and I'm not just saying this, um, HSS has truly prioritized maternal health and maternal mental health doing extraordinary things. And, but I want to go back into this, this space of racism. You know, we're talking about racism is trauma, right? We talked about implicit bias, you know, le leads to mistreatment. But there's all different forms of, you know, trauma that has contributed to poor outcomes among, among black women, for whether, it's, whether it's been vicarious traumas, inherited trauma. Um, and we know there are barriers. I know one of the things we do on the mom's tours, we teach our women how to advocate for themselves in healthcare settings. In addition, we tell them it's okay to fire your doctor. You know, just because you started with the doctor doesn't mean you need to stay with him if you're experiencing the, uh, this bias. So we all can agree we need changes, drastic changes, drastic changes to address the drastic disparities. So tell me, Alexia, what changes or improvements would you like to see in the healthcare system to better support black mothers during pregnancy, childbirth, and beyond? Uh, thank you for that. So there's a need to rebuild trust um, at so many different levels. In my travels, one of the things that I noticed, I got a chance to travel to a, um, a country to learn more about health outcomes and, and how they serve moms in different communities. And one of the things that they do in greeting is they do head to head, to head head to head, heart to heart, like that's part of their greeting. You embrace hands, you do head to head, heart to heart. And I think that's where the centering comes back um, into some of the improvements in rebuilding that trust is creating an environment where there's ownership and incentive. And so what I mean by, I know that CMS has done a, a, a wonderful job even in creating the safe designation opportunities for different hospitals and things um, like that. And what we want to do is promote and emphasize those who are doing it and operating at a high level as it relates to how they're creating a space for safety as it relates to birthing persons and even postpartum. And so that's one of the biggest things that comes to mind is building that space of ownership, seeing an improvement there. Not just, we say accountability, but it looks like ownership. So when you are embracing when you are getting these positive feedback from these positive birth outcomes, you are incentivized to do that and celebrate it for that. And so it's putting that responsibility and opportunity for these spaces to also be able to grow. I think another thing um, that I wrote was, as we are seeing expansion of covering doula services, that's another one. So when I think about the health care system is the health plan, um, as well as the health system that you're receiving your care from. And so we see, again, CMS doing a lot of work with covering those services for doulas, um, but making sure that it's a livable wage that you can get compensated for. One of the things, and I'll, I'll talk more about this in, in some of our closing too, if I have an opportunity, but one of the things that we prioritize is sustainability and what it looks like. This is a, a profession that is not new. Being a doula, um, we may use that language now. It's a Greek word, so in many of our minority communities, we may not have heard it referred to as that, but it is not new. Your aunt, cousins, etc., have been supporting you and families throughout these birth experiences and dads as well for decades, centuries. And so we want to be able to create that space for this birth attendant, who we call a doula at this point, to be able to have that professional support that they need to be able to grow in a workforce that embraces them. And that's another improvement that will come is the clinicians or practitioners in the healthcare settings opening up their their world and their arms, if you will, to embrace the doula workforce and the work that comes with that. I'm gonna turn it over now to Dr. Rachel. I mean, and I was thinking what you had mentioned earlier, you know, the need to increase our OBGYN um, uh, workforce with more culturally competent individuals, but do share more about what do you see the need the changes that are needed in our healthcare 
system. Yeah, thank you. And I think it's so important that we remember that these changes need to be at a systems level. I think so often we put the burden on black women to advocate for themselves, which is important, and educate themselves, which is important. But it is a systems level problem. The narrative that we're not taking care of ourselves in the community, that we don't eat well, we don't exercise, that is not the issue. That is not why we're dying. We are dying disproportionately because we are not getting treated well within a healthcare system. So as, as Dora was mentioning, the statistic in the United States is 30%, 33%, 33 women per th deaths per 100,000 lives births. That's 70 black women per 100,000 live births. And I think we have to always remember that these are not statistics. These are our mothers and our sisters and our cousins. These are members of our community that are impactful and we, were, we are losing black talent and black joy. And so we have to remember that. What the changes that I would like to see, I mean, there were so many changes. We could do a whole entire panel on what changes could happen, what we need to have happen. Um, and, and I know that you'll exp you know, talk more about on the federal level what's going on because the, the push that this administration has, has done has been just so outstanding. And I think as an OBGYN, I'm just, I love getting all of the, 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 the new action plans and what CMS is doing and the new care models because all of those things are important. For me, I think I would love to see us continue to diversify and expand the physician workforce and the provider workforce in general, the maternal care workforce, the doula workforce, the midwifery workforce. As far as black physicians, in the past 40 years, we have not increased the black workforce with any significance. You're still 5% of, uh, we're 5% of doctors are black. Um, we are certainly not at a pace to keep up and take care of all the black and brown faces that we know are coming, that will be in our, that are in our society now. And we know we are going to be a brown society in, in just a decade or two. So um, even though the narrative now is that diversity is not important anymore, it is certainly important because we had diversity and affirmative action plans and we didn't improve the numbers of black physicians in 40 years. So I'm actually uh, very nervous about what our workforce is going to look like and the lack of cultural humility, the lack of understanding of lived experiences, the lack of understanding of even what social determinants of health mean, the lack of maybe you tell a patient to go out and exercise, but they live in a place where they can't exercise, but you don't even understand that or take that into consideration. I think we're coming into a time that is going to be almost worse for our community. So um, I think to continue to push for diversity of all the healthcare workforce. We don't just need doctors, we need everybody. Um, we need um, to just expand that workforce to nurture the pipeline, to mentor, to make sure that we're starting very young because we really can't start in high school or even middle school. We really need to start just when <laughs> at birth with them, right? Our community needs to instill in our children that you can be and we need you in these roles in our community. Um, I also just, sorry. No, yeah, I, was oh. gonna, I was gonna go, um, no. I just wanted to also say we just also need to um, support policy changes. There's plenty of legislation that can never get passed because people don't think it's important because they think it's just really nice and social. But really understanding that in order to impact maternal mortality, you need to address those social determinants of health. That is what's making people not um, have poor outcomes and not safe. And for, for individuals to understand, or systems to understand that most of what people's health is is not related to what they get in the hospital or in the doctor's office. It's related to how they're able to access and, and be in those spaces. 
Thank you. I know we're coming down to our time. Um, don't quite know how much time we have, but I did want to um, ask Dr. Uh, Dora, um, looking ahead, what are the key priorities for CMS in advancing equity in maternal health outcomes for black women, and how can stakeholders collaborate to achieve these goals? And right before you answer, if there are any questions in the audience, can you please uh, write them down, raise your hand, and someone will collect the question and we'll ask it um, at the end of their final comments. So if you have any questions, please take a moment to write them down, raise your hand, and then someone uh, will collect the question and then we will ask it during final um, comments. Dr. Dorp. Uh, thank you. I, I think I'm just going to piggyback on uh, a few points that have been made um, <clears throat> by Rachel and Alexi. Alexi um, one is the focus you mentioned accountability, and I, I think that is an area that we are very much focused on at CMS. Uh, as many of you know, we are inviting hospitals to report uh, on a uh, maternal health measure. Are you participating in a national or, or state quality improvement perinatal collaborative? And the second part of the question is, are you implementing any safety bundles or maternal health bundles uh, that we know can improve the outcomes for moms? Uh, that is an example of one of the measures we're requesting, and depending on the responses, some of the hospitals, the health systems can receive the birthing-friendly designation. But that was just a first step. That was phase one. Uh, we also have finalized uh, two other measures. Certainly there's uh, others under consideration. Uh, what is the rate of low-race cesarean births uh, at your hospital? Uh, what is the rate of se severe obstetric complications at your hospital? As much as uh, many issues that hospitals maybe they can't address, in other cases, there are absolutely uh, um, care uh, gaps in care that should be addressed, must be addressed uh, by hospitals, other health systems, if we're going to move forward. Um, so accountability uh, is one key part. We've mentioned social determinants of health. We are also requiring uh, hospitals, facilities to begin to screen their patients uh, and other post-acute care settings, uh, the range of uh, uh, hospital care settings to screen for social determinants of health. And we're also, we'll be following up with, and did you refer uh, the patient to the social services uh, that they needed? So that's a second area. And the third issue I'll just mentioned, we are also very much attuned to this patient experience of care. Uh, across CMS, we're thinking through what is our patient reported outcome measures? What's the strategy there? But also, we're also looking at PREMS, PROMS and PREMS, the uh, patient self-reported experience uh, uh, with, their, uh, with their care. And thinking through how can we integrate these measures? How can we hold hospitals and other providers accountable for the patient experience of care just as we are holding them accountable for their clinical, um, the clinical outcomes of care? So for time, I'll, I'll stop there, but, um, uh, but I do very much, again, appreciate uh, the partnership and the alignment across these priority issues. And, and I just want to say, you know, we have to have these candid conversation. You know, we can't uh, speak as if it's not existing. And we all know that we are dealing with um, system problems, right? And if we, if we don't address it on that level, we're really spinning our wheels. Um, it's almost like when I think about, you know, a tree, you know, you cut off the branches, they'll keep growing back, right? So you really, really need to think about how do we address this um, at the root. Um, so as we conclude this um, panel, you know, we have a sea of uh, black and brown women and men who take pride in this month and in their race. They heard from us, and I'm sure, and I'm sure they want to do more. Right, um, and we have to do more because I remember back in the day when the village really did raise their children, and I think you know creating that uh, support, holistic support from the community level to the faith-based entities um, to Auntie Sarah and them, you know that were your next door neighbor, and um, I, I think all of those uh, are, are critical, and the doulas and the OBGYNs and um, seeing improvement in our maternal, black maternal health outcomes. So as we conclude this panel, can you just give them real quickly one action step they can take, or two, um, that, that they can take to assist in our overall efforts in improving black maternal health outcomes? So we'll start with Dr. Hughes. 
starting in reverse order. I was uh, thinking, I, okay, I have a few minutes to think about this one. Um, uh, so the, the one thing, if we were gonna ask, one of the issues that we forever are challenged with is the data. Uh, and particularly the data on the uh, interventions that you may be sponsoring or they may be at a small scale and a local level. Uh, just, the, just providing us the information on the intervention, the data that you have uh, is, is always very critical for us. Uh, and the other area, as much as we focus, we certainly engage stakeholders in the context of our rules. Um, but moving forward, we're trying to think about how do we do even more um, just on a proactive, not tied to a rule, not tied to a regulation or initiative, uh, but just really being uh, uh, on the front end. What are you working on? What are the issues? What are you hearing? Um, so that can better inform our work. Uh, and so to the extent that uh, as we start to roll out our engagement strategy uh, and that you're able to participate uh, in some fashion, Again, we would be very grateful uh, if you were able to do that, and we would find it tremendously useful. So I'll stop with those two. Rachel? Um, I think continuing to advocate, because I think, I don't know how many people are, because I'm speaking as a physician, but I would say, in general, continuing to advocate and uplift the voice of the black woman, black birthing person, um, in reproductive justice spaces, in maternal health spaces. There's so much that individually and collectively we can do as far as legislation that can get passed that will support community efforts, holistic efforts, efforts to reduce, reduce implicit bias, to improve data collection and quality work. Um, and I think the fact that we continue the fact that we need to continue to have um, spaces like this to have frank discussions, and we should not limit them to this month. We need to continue to really push, push the administration, which I know you're doing amazing work, um, in our communities as well, support community-based organizations that do so much work, um, and to really continue to advocate for the black woman. Thank you. And, and, and Alexia, in your comments, can you talk a little bit about, you know, we know that black maternal mental health, too, is an issue. We, are, we recognize that even in the postpartum period, um, a large amount of the morbidity mortality is due to that. So talk a little bit about what more we can do in that space as you bring your closing um, recommendations. That's perfect, because that's actually where I wanted to kind of draw from. And I, I thank Dr. Dora and um, Rachel for elevating what it looks like to show up and support from a policy perspective, from a federal perspective, kind of getting in where you fit in. So we know that oftentimes we elevate the message of voting, and that's important. But even at the state level, like in Pennsylvania, um, Rep. Mays, Curry, and Cephas have launched a Black Maternal Health Caucus. And so my, my pastor always says, you, you may see like your mayor your city council people and interact with them before you ever reached levels of presidential um, experiences. And so get close and connected there. We use that phrase a lot as it relates to the African proverb that it takes a village. But some of the village has been disempowered. So now we got to kind of like re-raise ourselves as a village. And so now we have to get educated either through access that are available, other CBOs. I know with Coco Life, one of the prominent things that we're doing is wanting to revolutionize what the perinatal space looks like as it relates to doula support and work, and especially from a mental health lens, because as, as Dr. Q, as Reverend Q said, English said, there is a lot that is impacting, and it is from the birth experiences and postpartum, but it's also when you come home with this life, if you are struggling with some of the other impacts of just life, transitioning back to work, what does it look like if, if COVID-19 has impacted your school access for other children that you have? And so I think us as a village, we have to keep our eyes open. You notice now when they build homes, we don't have a lot of front porches anymore. We got a lot of decks and we may have a lot of patios, but not a lot of front porches because we are not centering in as much on what's right in front of us, but we can. It's in our DNA, we know to, because that is what's historical in nature for us. So we do take those responsibilities to whether you decide to be a doula, 
OBGYN, midwife, what we call mom ambassadors. And so for us, mom means maternal outcomes matter. And so they have to matter to all of us. So if you see um, a mom or a birthing person that's in your presence, in your village, you acknowledge her. You make sure she's okay. You connect her to resources or other CBOs. We pride ourselves on connecting with our CBO partners like Once Upon a Preemie, like Well Beauty Lab. We pride ourselves on working with our health plans like Blue Cross Blue Shield and Tandem, and the list goes on, and academic institutions because as what was said, you don't start in the middle. We want to get in on the ground level and create this interdisciplinary learning and intergenerational knowledge sharing space and that's what you have where we are and where we sit in our time and our talent and our treasure that we can dedicate we have a responsibility to share our lived and learned experience to empower others and that I think is what's going to help us to be involved it's not just our responsibility as maternal health professionals it is all of us it definitely takes the community to keep this moving forward Wow, can we just give them a hand? That was powerful. You, you, you heard us say, you know, we need to re-raise ourselves as a village. And, and I just wanted to make a statement that we do have resources, um, uh, HSS, um, for one, as it relates to postpartum depression, uh, our office, OASH, Office of Women's Health, released a postpartum depression toolkit. If you want us to send you all of the links to these amazing resources that we have, please write us at partnerships at hhs.gov. That's partnerships at hhs.gov. And even though you've heard some statements that have been pretty dark or grim, there is hope. I always say that as long as there is breath, there is hope. And for many of us here, you're feeling some of you may feel sad, some of you may feel anger, and I always say, you know, what angers you is, is the problems you're assigned to solve. And what saddens you is what you're assigned to heal. So step into that space because it's going to take all of us to make a difference. One more time for our panelists. Thank you. Um, if we can, did we write down any Questions that we can, um, okay, here we go. Hello, my name is Angela McLemore, and uh, I am retired a hospital administrator, and I work for the Illinois Senate now. And I'd like to talk, uh, ask Dr. Villanueva something about a statement that you said. You said it is a health system speaking about our health system, that was not made for us. And I have heard a lot of things that our panelists have just spoken about, but could you just elaborate a little more on that? Um, in any country in the world, we know that the uh, maternal mortality rate is the number one uh, index as to uh, what a country's health status really is. And so could you speak a little bit about that? Um, I think my statement means is that, on? Yeah. Uh, that we have to keep in mind our history as we move forward and as president of NMA, I'm very, um, I always keep that history in mind of why NMA was founded. Um, and I think we have to remember that our health system was not made for black and brown people. They didn't want us to really access or have good health care. Um, and so some of the foundations of even how the, health, the systems work some of the educational foundations of how I was trained as a medical uh, care provider have those in inherent biases within them. Um, even, even how people get insured, there's, there are inherent biases in some of those plans. And I think we cannot be blinded to those facts. And as we try to move forward, we need to remember uh, that if we do not hold the systems accountable, change will not occur. 
Um, and I think we've been, you know, the maternal mortality statistics have only been getting worse and worse and skyrocketed during COVID. And so we have to ask, when does it, when does it stop? If we were looking at these statistics from some third world country, which they are the statistics of a third world country, we would rush in with some kind of aid, right? We need to rush in and aid our community. Thank you, Rachel. Next question. Yes, I have a question. Good morning. Oh, is this on? Yeah. You guys hear me? Okay, great. Uh, good morning. My name is Jay Wilson. I'm the founder of Melanated Moms. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Hi, y'all. <laughs> um, I saw one of the videos. Yay. Thank you. Um, so you actually um, gave a really great segue to the question I want to ask. So I was like, yeah, she read my mind. Um, so we know how implicit bias plays a huge role in the way that people receive care, but I don't think that we have enough conversation around implicit perception of the patient and the experience that they have in the healthcare system. Um, I've been seeing a lot of information and talking to a lot of people in the community around um, how the um, maternal health uh, deserts are increasing in size. Um, in different states and for different reasons, right? But how do we create more conversations with medical providers and other clinicians who help um, guide care um, with um, seeing the shift of different providers either leaving a state or leaving the profession entirely because they don't want to acknowledge the implicit bias they have? Um, yes, that's the first part of my question. And then the second part to that is how do we also shift that conversation with the patients who have the implicit perception of looking for care, being a victim of not being able to receive the care, and then ultimately being a part of the mortality and morbidity rates that we see? Thank you. So I, I think that's such an important question. Um, you touched on a number of different issues, and I think uh, I can speak for CMS some of the ways that we're starting to, to get at that. Uh, one is through one of our programs. We are providing uh, doctors and other providers um, stratified reports on the health outcomes. And so they see normally we would provide uh, the outcomes just average together. Uh, but now we are starting to provide these re um, the outcomes by racial and ethnic group. Uh, so to help a provider understand, are there differences in how I'm providing care or are there differences in access issues that I need to be uh, mindful of or even just to start the conversation there? So that's uh, one way we also for, I can speak on, uh, for the CMS Innovation Center, we uh, had an implicit bias pilot where we looked very generally at our policies, our deci the decisions that we were making in terms of who is eligible for extra services? Who is eligible to join a model? Uh, what were some of the other considerations that may have inadvertently embedded implicit bias into the model uh, that would have led to fewer uh, benefits or restrictions on eligibility, whatever the case may be uh, for the different model? And because of the pilot, we are starting to think through how can we uh, address implicit bias more systematically in the work that we do and proactively so we can identify and mitigate it early. Um, so I, I say, I'll use those as, provide those as two examples of, of ways that we are increasingly mindful of the issues that you're describing uh, and that we do have to make sure that this conversation, that it's okay uh, for us to have these conversations with our providers and for providers to have these conversations with each other as a way to think um, how can we address them head on. I think one of the systems that we need to hold accountable is the, educa the medical educational system and how they're educating um, providers and um, ensuring that implicit bias training is not just a one day training but woven throughout their, their educational system. I think ensuring that we see equity as a measure of quality and uh, is, is important as far as reimbursement 
because that's where when people will change. When it changes what their dollars look like, they're going to make sure that they're asking about social determinants of health. They're going to make sure their, their um, ratings are, their patient ratings are um, you know, up to par. But I think the issue of maternity care deserts, again, would be a whole, di whole other panel. Um, I think we do really need to take a close look at what is happening because people think it's all rural, but there's urban maternity care deserts. We're losing a lot of physicians. We're losing physicians of color, even the small numbers that we have. And I think finding innov innovative care models, finding innovative ways to encourage people to come to communities. I think we know that people of color preferentially practice in communities of color, which again goes back to ensuring that we have a diverse workforce and increasing the diversity of that workforce because we take care of our patients more. We do research more about communities of color and what impacts us. We include patients of color in clinical trials more. If we're a person of color, it all goes back to that importance of diversity, although the narrative now is that diversity doesn't matter. Can I, can I just, oh, yeah. hello. Um, I just wanted to add to it too because the question came up earlier about the system, right? And, and so that's an example. What Dr. Rachel said is the education, the medical educational system um, is likely training based on those same biases. And that's why even with implicit bias training, as uh, Dr. Dora was saying, it's being mindful of what's being trained because you, you have to watch because you can just help people be more implicit. If you don't make sure that there's that ownership and incentive associated with it, um, and that accountability piece. And so that's why when we look at the educational system, economic system, medical systems, that's the reason why we need to address it and kind of internally mix things up so that the system changes and serves us better, not just from where it is today, so to speak. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Galina Varchena, and I'm the policy director for Birth and Color. We're a doula collective and the Birth and Reproductive Justice Organization in Virginia. My question is uh, sort of a legal one. Um, sorry. Given the current legal attacks on DEI, including the California lawsuit challenging mandatory implicit bias training for doctors, how is the administration navigating these challenges? How do we shift the narrative? Because right now there's so many attacks on DEI, and I know that even in Virginia, as we're working through the legislature to pass an unconscious bias bill, to mandate training for physicians, we're having this question being raised by our legislators, even on sort of our side of the issue. We're saying, how do we prevent legal challenges? How do we do this the right way so we're not facing with financial consequences of these like anti-DI groups coming at us with their million dollar lawsuits? Why don't you start with, I have a legal question. Yeah, I'm we're not legal. We're not legal experts. Down. I'm like, it's not our pathway. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I would say, though, certainly at CMS, uh, we have DEI training. We uh, encourage, track how many of our employees uh, uh, take the training. Um, so I can certainly say, I can't speak to the legal issues, um, but so certainly internally, um, we certainly recognize the importance and are continuing on, but I don't know. Yeah, that's where, that's, I think that's our, that's our lane. So, yeah, we're going to stop there, and, and we can probably uh, connect you to someone in the, in the legal space here, but that's not our lane. I apologize for that. Um, so we're going to take two more questions, and then we're going to stop. So two more questions. She is, she's had her hands up for a while, too. Right here. She's had her hands up for a while. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. English, for your awesome, awesome leadership. I'm Desiree L.A. Whitfield. I am the president and CEO of D-Law MC Corporation, one that is conquering homelessness. My question is, have you all ever thought about implementing maternal health into a physical education slash health course for high schoolers? Reason being, 
you are here with the U.S. Department of Education, number one. And number two, female students start their menstrual cycle by the age of 12, which is reproduction. That would be your physical education part. And your part two would be your health education. You would be, you would be teaching them the tools, the facts about biases, and injustice when it comes to maternal health. We talk about doctors, but you have to start in high school teaching young women about their bodies. I think that's great, a great idea, and I even think that we should start earlier. So I think that's something that we should um, conversate about after. But yes, I think that's a great idea. Dr. Dora, you want to make a comment on that? I even think that even pulling in our U.S. Department of Education to have discussions around that would be good as well. I was thinking that's, a, that's an excellent idea. I would say through the CMS Innovation Center, we do have one model, the Integrated Care for Kids, where it is a partnership uh, between medical providers and schools uh, and social service sectors. Um, and in this case, focusing on mental health as well as um, uh, social needs. And I thought it was really impressive when this model was launched a number of years ago that one of the outcome measures was foster home placement for children. And I thought in my head, like, when would you ever thought that CMS, the nation's largest payer, as a major health outcome, a measure of success and an initiative that they would be sponsoring would be foster home placement. Uh, and so I think that really demonstrates that we are understanding that if we are truly going to be successful, we have to partnership with our other federal agencies, um, and the Department of Education certainly is one of them, and I will certainly take that idea back to the team. Oh, yeah. And Very good. I was just going to mention, too, um, it made me think about, again, the relationship that a lot of CBOs are bringing to the space. There's a lot of CBOs, a couple that come to mind are like Moms in Motion out of Chicago, um, A Chance to Learn out of Dallas, and a lot of other ones that center in on early childhood learning as it relates to physical health and women's health and introducing those concepts even about their cycles, um, one of the organizations out of Philadelphia, and I think that the evolution from a federal level is probably going to follow a lot of where we bring in, hey, this is a need, this is where we want to build some financial support and some and some backing for those two. So if, if it is through the Department of Education in collaboration with other CBOs and institutions of higher learning um, that are reaching kind of back into that area, middle school, high school, et cetera, to keep that learning flowing is what came to mind as you shared that too. Thank you. Final question. Yes. I have a question for Dr. Dora Hughes. So my name is Adriana Lewis. And I'm one of thousands of the callers who's taking calls for CMS, 1-800-MEDICARE. And the question is, like, our insurance that we have at work is, is completely unaffordable. It's $725, like, a month. That's the cheapest plan. And I just wanted to know, like, what are your, um, do you have any plans or... Uh, addressing, you know, HHS call center workers issues. I wasn't aware of that, but I, um, I do know that across all the programs, the issues of living wages and fair compensation is a priority. And uh, I certainly, I think Q has said, what's the personal commitments that you can make today? I, I will be sure to take that back to, uh, to our operational leadership and see if, what I can find out more about that. So thank you for that. Thank you for that question. Yes, we see that we have a lot of work to do, but we have to keep hope alive, each and every one of us. And so on behalf of uh, the United States Department of Health and Human Services, under the leadership of the Honorable Javier Becerra and the esteemed panelists here, we're looking forward. We really are looking forward to continuing this journey until justice has cried her last tear. Thank you.
Um, thank you all. I get the honor of uh, closing us out today. Thank you all so much to our amazing panel. Thank you for your really thoughtful questions and for being in dialogue with us. Um, thanks to all the presenters today. Um, I really uh, think we all enjoyed sharing this space and building community with you. Um, just wanted to reflect for a second on some of the things that I heard today. Um, and I hope you will reflect on as well. Um, HHS is committed to equity by design, and we trust that we will be successful, um, but also hope that you will challenge us and partner with us to be successful in achieving equity um, in the structures and designs of our policies and our programs. Um, we take inspiration from those who cared for us in community and family and hope that they drive our continued efforts to ensure that we as black people and we as all people, all Americans, can be well and enjoy good health and well-being. Um, we want to celebrate the success of 44 states and DC and the Virgin Islands extending Medicaid postpartum coverage, 21 million plus people covered by the Affordable Care Act with health insurance, um, uh, recent efforts to, to connect um, mothers in particular to community providers for mental health um, and uh, really see opportunity in doing so much more there. Um, we are charging you and encourage you to be trusted messengers yourselves, to share information about what the administration is doing well. Um, how it is affecting our communities and the work ahead. We have some real talk here about social drivers and structural discrimination and racism and the negative impacts that it has on black maternal health, um, black people's health overall, um, and that how that has to be a, a thought about how we address change in our policies. Um, we heard about policy opportunities um, such as creating environments of belonging, um, ownership, and trust with our systems and providers, um, sustaining a culturally competent and diverse workforce that can support mental he uh, maternal health, um, supporting our community-led organizations to honor their work and the good work that they are doing in community, and to share data and evidence about um, interventions and approaches that are working. And I will say, not just the data and the numbers, but the stories and the narratives about how it's really impacted people's lives. Um, so I just hope that you are leaving this space with some inspiration, some concrete ideas about um, how you too can help us improve health equity, black health equity how you can share information with your networks um, and continue on with us in this work. So please uh, leave this space, have safe travels, and thank you so much for your time today. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.